Applaud if you're enjoying this great evening hands off. Oh, 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 oh. It's hands on. Hello, we have clarified that. It's a hands on evening, not a hands off evening. And those that organize this are very touchy about that. So uh, I think it's a great night. I think it's amazing that I have the opportunity to stand up here and talk to all of you. Uh, my name is Michael Landsberg. I host a talk show on TSN called Off the Record. And uh, why I'm up here, though, is the fact that uh, not a lot of people who do what I do say the four words that I'm going to say to you now. I suffer from depression. And for some reason, we live in a world where it's not really acceptable to say that, where still the stigma exists. And one of the reasons why all of you are here and why I'm standing on the stage is because of the stigma. I mean, there's not a lot I can do in 10 minutes. Uh, if you want someone who can tell their whole story in 10 minutes, don't get a guy like me with multiple disorders. I've got depression and anxiety and ADD and dyslexia. If you want someone to talk in 10 minutes, get someone with just one disorder. So I, I'm just going to have to narrow it down to the one. So I suffer from depression, four words that you seldom hear people say. And it's my blessing in my life to be able to say that in front of all of you. Because two and a half years ago, on Off the Record, the show that I host, I interviewed a guy named Stefan Rishi, Stanley Cup champion, Montreal Canadiens. I had read about him in the past, and I knew that he suffered from depression, but I had never talked about it. And I said to him, is it okay if I ask you about that? And I said, I will say at the same time that I suffer as well. And he thought about it long and hard, and he said, it's really painful for me to talk about, but okay. And I asked him, and it was kind of a throwaway, it was 90 seconds, I wasn't trying to change the world, I wasn't thinking, wow, this is going to be something really good to do, I just thought it would make for interesting television. And then, after the show was over, I checked the emails for the show, and there were letters, almost all from men, that said it changed their lives to hear someone talking about their own mental illness. Letter after letter that said almost identically this, I have suffered for 15 years, I've suffered for 10 years, and I've never told anyone about my mental illness because I was always ashamed. But to hear somebody else talking about it, all of a sudden it didn't sound so bad. So I'm sharing this with you, and tomorrow I'm going to go to the doctor. And I found out that I have this power, because I have the history of the illness, which if you don't have it, you can't really talk about it. Because the truth is, if you've never suffered from depression in particular, but any mental illness, you can't possibly understand what it means. But that's true of every illness. You know, I, I say to people all the time, if you suffer, don't expect others to understand your illness. They'll never understand it. And nor should they. It's like if, if you went through a hospital into the chemotherapy ward and you said to people, hey, I know what you're going through. They would say, well, how do you know? You've never been through it. It's the same thing with mental illness. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to know what it is. You just have to appreciate what it is. And that's why it's so important for guys like me who get the platforms to get up here and say, hey, yeah, I suffer. I've been through it. I continue to go through it. I haven't figured out now that I suffer about four days in a month uh, for me are kind of dark days. Uh, and I know that they're coming, but those days are both the worst thing in my life and the best thing in my life. And I say the best thing in my life because nobody appreciates their mental health unless it's taken away. No one's skipping down the street going, wow, you know what, I'm so happy that I'm mentally healthy. Unless you have it taken away. And when it's taken away, all of a sudden now on those days, that creep on, you say, oh, man, I can't believe how bad this is. I had forgotten. It's, it's like anything. I don't think the brain can remember pain. So when I have that, it reminds me just how important it is for me to get out here. Because you know what? The one thing that all of us feel. Let me do a little poll here. And you don't have to be honest. You don't have to raise your hand. Um, first of all, how many people here have suffered from a mental illness? How many people here, and that to me tells me there's probably lots of people here who aren't raising their hands because they don't want to, which is, which is cool. I'm not here to out anyone. Uh, I'm not here to say that, hey, I did it, you should do it, because we're, we're all very different. But when you don't share, you send a message to yourself, which is that you have something to be ashamed of. And people say all the time, hey, you know, I, I heard it tonight. Good for you for doing this. You're brave. And I say, you know what? No bravery whatsoever needed on my part because I'm not scared. And to, to have bravery, you have to have fear. But I have no fear of doing what I'm now. I could care less what people think about me. I could care less about the fact that they may see me as a lesser person because I suffer from this mental illness. But it doesn't really make a difference. How many people don't raise their hands if they care for someone who suffers from a mental illness? Not many people don't have their hands up in the room. Yet, why is it that so many of us suffer, and yet we all feel so lonely? 
And the answer to that is, to me, that one of the symptoms of the illness is this feeling of loneliness, this feeling of isolation, this feeling that nobody else understands you, no one else feels this, you're all by yourself. And that's why it is so important, more important for the people who didn't raise their hand for the illness, but no people who have the illness, to understand the sense of loneliness that we feel. And you have the ability to make people feel a little bit less lonely. And I think that we're all part of the problem. The stigma still exists. I think all of us still do it. You know, if you've ever said to someone, snap out of it. If you've ever said to someone, you know, what do you have to be depressed about? I understand why you say that. Because I would have said it before I felt this illness for the first time 15 years ago. So I think that it's crucially important for everybody in this room who cares for someone, who loves someone, who suffers from this, to take time and really think about what you can do for them to make them feel less isolated. And one of the ways that you can do that is to make sure that you impart in them the fact that you understand this is not their fault. The first thing, I blame myself, I have to be honest with you, the four days a month when I'm not feeling good, I think to myself, wow, you know what, why, why am I, why am I struggling so much? I should know better than this. I've been through this for 15 years now, over and over and over again. Why do I let this happen to me, and why do I let it drag me down? And I lose confidence. The first two days of the Olympics, I've never said this to anyone outside my family. I was desperately depressed. I hated everything about my life. I was, I was, I was beyond myself afraid uh, to go on television and look to the camera, because the confidence that I feel right now, because I feel pretty good today, was gone. And yet, I understand this illness. I've lived with this illness. I've read everything imaginable. Slight hypochondriac. I, of course, read everything about depression. Uh, but I understand this illness really, really well. Yet, a guy like me who understands it, who's been through it, who makes his living from the confidence that I have on a good day, that confidence is gone. So you have to look at the people that you care about who may be suffering and understand you can't snap out of it. You know, what you want to say to someone is, you know what, get out of bed. You know what, you'll feel better if you do something. Well, you know what, it doesn't matter where you are. To me, de depression, true depression is, and um, my, my friend Dr. Bryce Wilde over there, although we like to call him Bruce, uh, I'm sure has people in his office all the time, right? You would go and you would decide whether or not you would diagnose depression, right? And I think that you could Google the symptoms of depression and find 2 million hits or 50 million hits. But to me, the one thing that all of us feel when we suffer is this. When you wake up in the morning and you open your eyes, you are 100% sure, as sure as sure could be, that nothing good will happen that day, that you will feel no joy. And in the absence of joy, and more than that, in the absence of the hope for joy, there really is not living. To me, a day spent depressed is like a day that you've given up that you'll never get back. So I think you need to understand that. And one of the things that I do is I go around and talk to groups like this and, and, and try to make you understand that depression, anxiety, any of the illnesses we're talking about are incredibly difficult to understand if you're not suffering because you can't see them. You can't biopsy them. You can't do a blood test. You can't ever show physical, a physical explanation or evidence that this illness exists. So there is this tendency for all of us to say, you know, I get it, but come on, you know, it's time. You gotta, you gotta get out and do something. And it's really difficult to understand. And that whole dynamic that exists between those that suffer and those that don't and those that care that suffer um, is really, really at the heart of this matter. I mean, there's so many tragic and tragic incidents and tragedies that um, people have experienced in this room and that I've heard from you. And it, it, it breaks my heart because I, through talking about this on television, and through writing about it, and um, I, I correspond with a lot of people. And the stories that I hear are heartbreaking. But, and I would be moved to tears right now if, if I wasn't on medication, but it's impossible for me to cry, so I'll just continue talking. And if you're on medication, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what? The tie's coming up, seriously. They say, oh, it's a normal life, forget that. So, hold on, so nothing I do gets any applause whatsoever when I take my tie off and you're applauding. Well, it's a, it's a cheap audience here. I try to, to share with people like all of you who care 
the reason why you're here tonight is that you think it makes a difference. But let me, let me be a little bit more militant and say that to really make a difference, you really, really, really have to understand what it's like to suffer. And let me rephrase it, you have to appreciate what it's like. And I just think it's so important that, you know, when you, you have the power to change someone's life who's around you. You have that power because you can make them feel less lonely and you can try to give them the confidence to go out and get help. And you can try to make them feel less ashamed of this, this, this terrible cycle that exists is that, you know, we fall into a depression or we suffer from anxiety and we're too embarrassed and we're too ashamed to talk about it so we get worse and this cycle continues to spiral us down. And you have the ability to, to break that cycle and break that spiral by, by really appreciating the fact that um, even though you can't see the illness, it is, it is there. You know, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I mean, normally I speak a lot longer and I really enjoy the sort of conversing with the audience. If you have, if you have a question or you want to make a comment, just raise your hand up and, uh, and throw it out there. But I think that for me, the single greatest blessing of my life is this thing called my mental illness because in what other aspect of my life could I possibly hope to make a difference in people's lives? And I talked about the first time I, I, I talked about this on television. And, you know, I, I say this without a, a hint of ego. This is nothing to do with what I say. It's the fact that I get the platforms to say it and the fact that I've, I've lived it so I have credibility in that area. And I found out that I have this enormous power just by talking to make people feel better. And let me tell you about the first, the first day that I got this response. I got a letter from a guy who said, you know, I've suffered from depression, I've never told anyone this. And I emailed him back, thank God, and I said to him, you know, tell me about it. And he said, well, I'm too embarrassed, I think it's a weakness, I'm a father, and I think that my kids will see me as being weak. And we went back and forth, and I, you know, convinced him in this letter to say, hey, you know what, if you're telling me, you tell someone else. And once you tell one other person, there's this power and this momentum that you build up. And I said, you know, go to see a doctor tomorrow. Make an appointment with your general practitioner tomorrow. And this was at night, so the, the, the option to do it immediately wasn't there. And he did, and I didn't hear from him again until this past February when uh, I did this documentary for CTV on depression and sports and athletes and, and me. And I got a letter from him saying, you don't remember me, which I did remember him. And here's what his letter said. You don't know what was going on that day. I had vowed on that day that I watched off the record that I would kill myself. And when I emailed you, I had looped a rope over a hook in my closet. And I went, after I'd sent the email, to take my own life. But you emailed me back, and I heard the computer make the noise, and I went back and I responded to you. And then you responded to me, and we went back and forth. And he said, I even yelled at the computer, God, the guy won't shut up, even on the computer. And we went back and forth enough times that he said, you know, hey, you know what, maybe he makes some sense. Maybe there is help. Maybe I shouldn't be ashamed. Maybe, maybe I can live another day and, and, and hope for the best. And he said, that was two and a half years ago. And since then, I've gone for help. My life is 100% turned around. I now celebrate every day. And he said, you never knew that that's what was going on. And it wasn't. I mean, I'm not in any way in this dynamic a hero. I didn't know that, that I was having that kind of influence. I was just doing what a normal person would do, which is respond to someone. And I realized you know, at, at that point that this is, this is a rare blessing that I have to be able to go out and to be able to talk and to be able to share and to be able to say, hey, that's me. You know, I, 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with depression. I thought my life was over at the time. Uh, I went on Prozac, uh, then the drug of choice. And I remember for two weeks praying that the drug would kick in and becoming enormously afraid that I wasn't getting better. And I remember the moment where I was at a restaurant and I was at the front of the restaurant and I went to the back of the restaurant. And from the time I was in the front to the time I was in the back, I went, oh my God, I think I feel better. And there was this light that came on. And the truth is that you don't know how far you've slipped until you get it back. And then you go, wow, you know, I was a lot sicker than I thought. So I understand what it's like. Four years ago, I had been off medication for a couple of years, and I relapsed. And I suffer from this anxiety, and I worry about the health of one of my kids. I worry about this chronically all the time. And I kept slipping lower and lower and lower. And as my anxiety got worse, my depression got worse and worse and worse. 
and I was in a really bad way. And I have to tell you, if I thought there was no help, if I didn't know that for me medication would help me, I couldn't have gone on living. There was no point in living. There was no joy. There was nothing. And until you've experienced that, you can't truly understand the concept of wanting to take your life. And I say to people who don't understand it, who think that there's a selfish element to it. I mean, Wade Belak was one of my best friends. And tragically, just over a year ago, uh, he took his own life. And people would say, how could he do that? He had everything. He was a hockey player. He made all that money. He had a wife and two kids. How selfish is he? And I said, imagine this. Imagine that someone cuts off your leg, and you're in this enormous pain, and it's not going away. And a day later, no one's giving you help. And two days later, you would at some point say, you know, I can't go on with this. This pain is too great. I've got to find another answer. And if the answer isn't help, there's only one other answer. So I 100% get it. But I was blessed with the fact that I knew that there was help. And I ended up getting help. But now, four years later, I feel good 26 out of 30 days. 27 of 31, and I consider that um, a, a huge blessing. So, in the end, there can, there can be happy endings, but folks, you know, the bottom line is, if if you are suffering or someone you know is suffering, then there is only two options: continue to suffer or get help. And one of the things that you need to do, if you're not someone who needs help, but someone who knows someone who does is make those people feel comfortable enough to be able to share. And I think we should live in a world where um, if I say, who here suffers from a mental illness, everyone who does will put up their hand because it's no different than anything else. I mean, I'm not the first guy to say that, hey, if there's a physical illness and we were all here, and I said, hey, you know, and this was a fundraiser for heart disease. If I said, how many people here suffer from heart disease? No one's going to go, oh my god, I'm so embarrassed. I don't want people to know what my clogged arteries. No one's going to say that. But when it comes to mental illness, still, we live in a time where people think less of us. But worst of all, we think less of ourselves because all of the surroundings that we experience, the environment, tells us that we're doing something wrong. So just, you know, I, I don't really have much more of a message other than really share. Share your feelings if you suffer, and if you don't suffer, share your feelings with those who do. And, and be compassionate to the point where you're never going to understand it. You're always going to think, you know what, why don't they get out of bed? Well, I can tell you, you know what, it's impossible when you're sick. So thank you for having me here. Hold on. Hold on, I can see you ready to apply. Um, and, and just let me say this, that um, it's a true, amazing gift that I've been given to be able to come up here and, and talk to a room like this and to be able to share these experiences. Because if you could have told me four years ago when I was at the Grey Cup in a hotel room suffering really, really badly at that time, if you could have told me that I'd be up here and I'd think in some way that this was a blessing in my life, I would say not a chance in the world. But it is because I get to I get to share it. I get to publicly wine. And now you're all sympathetic. You're all going, oh, poor man.